Calling this meeting to order. This is our city council uh, regular meeting. We're in Mon County Commission Chambers in 243 High Street. Uh, it's Tuesday, April 2nd, 2024, and it's a little bit after 7 p.m. We're calling the meeting to order and asking the clerk if she would please call the roll. Yes. Deputy Mayor, Deputy Mayor Abu Ghanim. Present. Bill Kowecki. Here. Weezy Michael. Here. Danielle Trumbull. Here. Dave Harshbarger? Here. Brian Butcher? Here. Mayor Celine? Here. We'll all stand for the pledge. <coughs> pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. We have three sets of minutes, the March 19th, 2024 uh, regular meeting minutes, the March 26th, 2024 special meeting minutes, uh, special meeting one minutes, the March 26th, 2024 committee of the whole meeting minutes. Um, we would normally approve them through acclamation if there's... Everybody's good? Just a typo yes. on um, the C City of Westover's uh, attorney, his name is Stranko. It was listed as Senko. No. So just a TR to add to the name, please. That was in my report. Great. Thank you. Thank you for noticing that. Otherwise, we good? Yep. All right. Thank you. Correspondence. So we are going to start with Autumn Williams and um, Sexual Assault Awareness Month. Hi. month is intended to draw attention to the fact that sexual violence is widespread and has public health implications for every community member of Montgomery County. And whereas rape, sexual assault, and sexual harassment impact our community, as seen by statistics indicating that one of five women will have experienced sexual assault by the time they complete college, Fisher, <coughs> Cullen, and Turner, um, 200. And whereas we must work together to educate our community about what can be done to prevent sexual assault and how to support survivors, and whereas staff and volunteers of West Virginia Sexual Assault Programs and other professionals have come together as a West Virginia Foundation for Rape Information Services, um, uh, WV Frizz, to support each other in their work and provide the state of West Virginia and its citizens with a central source of information on sexual assault, and whereas with leadership, Dedication and, and encouragement, there's compelling evidence that we can be successful in reducing sexual violence in Montgomery County through prevention education, increased awareness, and holding perpetrators who commit acts of violence responsible for their actions. And whereas the Rape and Domestic Violence Information Center, RDBIC, strongly supports the efforts of national, state, and local partners and of every citizen to actively engage in public and private efforts, including conversations about what sexual violence is, how to prevent it, and how to help survivors connect with services, and how every segment of our society can work together to better address sexual violence. Now, therefore, be it resolved that I, Jenny Celine, Mayor of the City of Morgantown, West Virginia, on behalf of the City Council, join anti-sexual violence advocates and support service programs in the belief that all community members must be part of the solution to end sexual violence. Along with the United States government and the state of West Virginia, the council does hereby proclaim April 2024 as Sexual Assault Awareness Month in Montgomery County and applause the efforts of many victim services providers, service providers, police officers, prosecutors, <coughs> national and community organizations, and private sector supporters for their efforts in promoting awareness about sexual assault. And I just wanted to mention that Back in the day, I used mm -hmm. to work um, victim and witness assistance at the county courthouse. So I worked with RDVIC almost every day. Okay. So anyway, I appreciate your work <laughs> and uh, would like to hand this to you. Thank you very much. And congratulate you. Thank you.
just Here just thank you everybody for your support that's it's much appreciated so thank you thank you thank you <laughs> All right, so who's coming next? Vicki Ashcroft. Somebody for Fair Housing Month proclamation. I don't see Vicki. Well, I can just, I'll read it and then I'll bring it to you. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'll, I'll, come, I'll come bring it to you in a minute. Okay, whereas under the federal fair housing law, Title um, Eight of the Civil Rights Act of uh, 1968, no American should have the right uh, to purchase or rent shelter or purchase or rent shelter of choice abridged because of race, color, religion, sex, handicap, familial status, national origin, sexual orientation, or gender identity. And whereas under the West Virginia S State Fair Housing Law, Title 49-2-305 MCA, it is illegal to deny housing to any person because of race, sex, religion, color, age, physical or mental disability, or national origin. And whereas it is the fundamental policy of this nation, our state, and our city to advance, safeguard, and defend the principles and guarantees of equality of opportunity for all. And whereas the places where people live have a direct impact on the quality of their health, education, and access to economic opportunities. And whereas discriminatory housing practices create racial and economic segregation in communities that can lead to desperate outcomes in overall quality of life. And whereas the city of Morgantown believes that understanding of and access to fair housing laws have made our community and our neighborhood stronger and more vibrant. Whereas we are committed to programs that will help educate the public about the right to fair housing practices in the city of Morgantown, whereas we are committed to promoting housing choices and fostering inclusive communities free from housing discrimination. Now, therefore, I, Jenny Celine, Mayor of the city of Morgantown, uh, West Virginia, on behalf of City Council, want to thank the many people and organizations in our community who have opened the doors of housing opportunity to all citizens and proclaim the month of April 2024 to be Fair Housing Month. And I'm wondering whether Vicki Ashcroft happens to be in the room. Um, and I will come and present this. You might want to explain who you're presenting to. That she's our committee member. Never mind. Go ahead. Oh, yes. So if you were two minutes and then we'll... I got four. It says four. Um, it is April's Fair Housing Month. It's also Sexual Assault Awareness Month. It's a lot of months. Um, for fair housing, the state always puts together a fair housing fair. This year it's being held in Morgantown on April 18th, I believe. Could be 20th, I'm not certain. It will be on our website, which is hrc at morgantownwv.gov. No, that's our email address, but... Yeah, go to the city webpage and Human Rights Commission, and we shall have all the information up there. And also, we have finally gotten control of our Facebook page, and we'll put it there, hopefully, if the brain still works. Yes, so, perfect. You may want to introduce yourself. She did. Did you? I'm sorry. Yes. Uh, this uh, uh, sorry, proclamation was not put forth by the Human Rights Commission. I'm accepting it on their behalf. Yes. Just wanted, just wanted to give you a little heads up and a little promotion for the Human, for the Rights, Human Rights Commission. Commission? Yes. Sorry. To which people need to apply to be members. There you go. Yes. As long as they're residents of the city of Morgantown, that'd be fantastic. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for, thank you for making that pitch. Now we have the Riverfront Task Force presentation. Uh, Steve Celine.
Hi. Good evening. <laughs> Good evening, y'all. A lot of familiar faces up there. Um, I, I'm the other Celine here. Um, I'm representing, tonight I'm representing the interests of the Morgantown Riverfront um, Revitalization Task Force, which is a, a bit of a mouthful, but we're, uh, we're a voluntary group that was commissioned by the city uh, to uh, promote the, the enhancement, uh, the enhancement of the riverfront. And um, I put two handouts in your packets. Um, so that's got most of what I just want to try to hit the highlights of those, of those handouts um, tonight and then maybe close with a, with a recommendation um, for, for the city. Um, I also wanted to, uh, I came into this, uh, I think, what, at the end of summer. Um, Jessica wanted to acknowledge Jessica McDonald, um, right, Jessica McDonald's work uh, chairing this committee in the past. And so I came into this uh, late summer, so about a half a year into this, and uh, this is the first time I've, I've uh, reported out to council. So I think the format in the past was uh, maybe to focus on accomplishments of the, of the task force over the last 12 months. I, um, I'm going to focus a little bit more on the future of the riverfront. That's, that's my, my goal here today. But um, uh, so if you could follow along, let's see if this, this works. Yeah, if you could follow along with it, we'll start with this opportunity analysis. Uh, we crafted this uh, late December 23 as the city was going into its budget period. So we, we tried to um, you know, highlight some, some short term on the first page, short term and long term projects that we felt would move the riverfront uh, zone forward. But we started with just a few policy concepts just because we feel like this is really what we need to be thinking about going forward. So thinking about the riverfront as a, as a holistic corridor uh, and you know, work toward planning and management and marketing of a one riverfront uh, corridor. Uh, that, that's really um, what we think is important going forward. So um, some short-term and long-term projects. I, hopefully you've, you've looked that over before the meeting. I wanted to focus uh, on the second page here, the work, more work plan and budget items uh, going forward. I'm going to circle back to this a couple times. Uh, in my presentation, but the main takeaway, the main recommendation uh, we want to make uh, to council is to support a, a riverfront master planning process um, for the whole riverfront, for the one riverfront um, area between the MUB um, facility on one end and the MUB water treatment, the water treatment plant on one end and the sewage treatment <laughs> plant on the other end, that whole core that includes the Arboretum uh, there. Um, so some key, that's really the main takeaway we wanted to make, but we had a couple other what we felt like were strategic projects going forward, uh, such as the trail lighting which we're moving forward on. Um, and uh, building some mountain bike pump tracks uh, near the Heritage Park there next to the rail trail. Um, so uh, just wanted to focus on those, those work plan items uh, there. But uh, Christine, you have to help me. Uh, did I minimize this? Oh, there we go. How about that? Okay, so I really want to move on to the, to the, to the other handout because this, this is hot off the press. Um, we just reported this out to our, um, our Riverfront Task Force meets once a month. We usually meet on the fourth uh, Thursday in the morning um, and, um, and we just reported out to the task force last Thursday. Um, so this is our opportunity to, to get this out to a, a broader audience, uh, get it out to the press, as well. Um, and so uh, what we did, this started, um, this started last, last fall. We did a walkabout of the riverfront. We did a, a walking assessment. We had maybe a dozen people uh, that came out and did a walking assessment. We had a form to go along with it. And we got done and we thought, well, we should expand this out to a broader set of riverfront um, stakeholders. So, so we did. Um, 
And uh, let's see, we had, uh, who's the GIS guy? Who's Marvin. 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 Marvin was help, helped me to put that, put that survey into a ArcGIS. It had five open-ended questions. We wanted to get communities' uh, ideas on the strengths of the riverfront, uh, challenges, uh, particularly the vision that people have for our, our riverfront, and then some of the next steps, some of the short-term actions that, that we need going forward. So um, we sent that out uh, to a broad set of uh, riverfront stakeholders. Um, we ended up with 119 usable responses um, from that online survey. And then basically what I did is to um, organize those into meaningful categories. Um, and, uh, and, and this is what we ended up with here. So I'll just, I just want to hit the highlights here, but we'll start with strengths. That's a good place to start. But people, uh, you know, 52, over, over half of pe uh, the respondents felt like the rail trail um, was a huge strength and the, and the amphitheater and the summer concert, those three things just blasted out of the, the data there. So those were huge strengths, but you can see um, many, of the other, uh, many of the other strengths. I was really interested that um, people felt were really happy with the progress made on the riverfront. You know, it wasn't all negative. People were generally pleased with progress made, but then they also saw a lot of opportunity to do more. Um, so I, I thought that was really, really neat. Um, and then what I did is I, I summarized the, the data. So what we have here is the, the number of mentions and then the percent of the total, right? The percent of 119 total respondents. And then I just tried to pick out what I felt like were some of the most interesting quotes, direct quotes that applied to those, those priorities. And I was just struck by, the, by how serious everybody took took this exercise. You know, they really care a lot about the riverfront and want to be involved in the, in the future of the riverfront. So I just thought they were real quotable uh, things here about, about the strengths of, of the riverfront. So I'll let you, let you enjoy those quotes there. But OK, then we're going to move on to challenges. You know, along, along with strengths, there's always challenges. And uh, you know, obviously, uh, this is probably not a surprise that the, the unhoused issue and, and trash and, and all down along the riverfront were top of the mind for a lot of people. 61% of people mentioned the, the unhoused issue as something that, that, that was a challenge to overcome. And I know we're all working towards solutions to that, but that is, that is a, big, a big deal. Uh, a lot of people want to see a more holistic approach to riverfront planning. Uh, a lot of people saw underdeveloped property in different locations. Uh, we need more property control. That's the flip side of that. But um, you know, those were the those were the challenges, and some telling some telling quotes about each of those. So. Strengths, challenges, um, vision, I love this. This to me is the most useful section of the survey, people's vision for the riverfront. It was amazing, just so many good things, but the things that really popped out of the, the results were um, you know, people talking about improving walking connections to downtown and to the neighborhoods. Um, the riverfront is close to those, but, but it's a challenge to, to get back and forth. And then this is another one I really wanted to highlight is river interaction and connections. People really want to have a more intimate connection to the river. They, they want to be closer to the river. So think, uh, think of boardwalk along the river where people could be right down close to the water. People want, want that. And so you know, as we think about future projects, let's think about how we can get people down so they can dangle their feet in the water, so they, they can be encouraged to fish on, on a dock, um, ways that we can get people right down close to the water. I love this guy's quote here. Check, check this first quote out. Uh, let's see. Now, he wants an immersive waterfront 
and um, a third space where people can gather and share emotion and connection. That, that wasn't the one I really wanted. I wanted the one about the, let me go back up here and just grab that one, the river. <coughs> Where's my river quote? Ah, oh, there it is. Somebody had been to the San Antonio uh, riverfront. They said, hey, they have a narrow concrete line ditch. We have a real river, right? <laughs> we have a real river flowing through Morgantown, West Virginia. Let's celebrate it. Let's get people right down there to really enjoy and interact with the river. And you know, the Corps of Engineers has made it pretty much a lake, right? It's pretty safe a lot of times, you know, sometimes at flood stage. Right now, there's a lot of water flowing through there. But most of the time, it's a, it's a nice pond out there. You know, beginners can go out there and paddleboard. So anyway, challenges, <laughs> long-term vision. Um, what I did is I broke it. I, I should have mentioned this. I broke vision into two different ones. The first one, tab, the first chart is the character of the river, which is sort of what they wanted to feel like, <coughs> right? What they wanted to feel. They wanted to feel clean. They wanted to feel safe. Uh, they want more community-based activities, right? They want opportunities for local bands to to do pop-up activities <laughs> along the riverfront. Um, so, so that, that was the character. And then the second table is more the type of experiences that they want to see <coughs> down along the riverfront. And uh, they, they want more river recreation. They want more live entertainment, uh, more shops, small business, dining, uh, lots of really good uh, specific ideas. And in the report, you'll see I, I tried to collect some of the really good ideas that people had. I think I have it in my... In my uh, conclusions here, but so many creative ideas for, for projects, for development projects. Um, just <coughs> fantastic. And then short-term actions, uh, short-term acts, you know, solving the unhoused issue, of course, way up there, clean up the trash, stronger leadership. You know, a lot of people talked about wanting more focus, more leadership, more planning um, along the riverfront. They want a, more police presence. You know, right down the line there in terms of short-term actions. Increase, increase programming and events along the, the waterfront. So, so then in the last, uh, last page, I just tried to summarize what I felt like were the biggest <coughs> takeaways, some of the conclusions. People want to interact more closely with the river. Uh, they, they, want to, they want us to address the unhoused issue there. They want to feel safe and experience a clean waterfront. They want to activate underutilized and, and dilapidated space and buildings along the riverfront. They want more community-based events. And here's the list of all the creative projects. You know, boardwalks along the, the water, a fishing trail. Somebody said they want to sink a barge. They want to sink a barge and put shops and bars, you know, along the bars that can break down along, along the water there. Um, they want a PRT station down at the waterfront place, mountain bike features along the rail trail, a whitewater park, um, a zip line. How about that? A zip line from up above, down across. What do you think, Vincent? Wouldn't that be cool? <laughs> think, think zip line. Let's go. Absolutely. Uh, Jen and I got back from Quebec City. They've got a toboggan slide in front on the hill in front of Quebec City. You can you can take a toboggan right down the big hill on the riverfront. Pretty cool winter event. So be creative. They want the waterfront to be a gathering or hangout place, <coughs> a proud focal point for the city of Morgantown. They're generally happy with the progress made, but they see a lot of opportunities. And then here's my main takeaway tonight is uh, just to see a more holistic and strategic approach taken to enhance the riverfront. See more focus planning, staffing, organization, marketing, and cooperation brought to bear on, on this one uh, riverfront area. So takeaway quote, the Morgantown Riverfront, think of it like a chill place with nature eco-friendly tech, and cool community spaces. The goal is to make the Morgantown Riverfront awesome for everyone for the next 10 years. So, 
So there it is. And then uh, I, Christy and I, I added, uh, it didn't go into your packet, but we can get you. I, I added some survey implications just because I really wanted to hammer the developing a riverfront master plan. That's really the one main takeaway is that we really think that the city of Morgantown with partners, you know, a master planning process should be maybe led by the city, but the university should be involved. MUB should be involved. They anchor both ends of the riverfront. Um, the core, you know, the core should be involved. The core of engineers should be involved in riverfront planning, right? They hold a key piece of the puzzle there um, with that. So, so there you go. So with that, that's that's it. Right. Do you have any questions, thoughts, comments? Look, I got done and she didn't even gavel me. Good. I could. <laughs> Thank you for your input. Thank you. I have a question. Yeah. Steve, thank you. It's great. Um, sure. Have, have you all been able to engage a Corps of Engineers is, with support of helping with the cleanup of the trash behind Frank. the dam? Oh, with trash. No, I've, mostly I've been talking to Frank. What's Jenny, what's Frank's last name? Janasic. Oh, Frank uh -huh. Janasic. I'm working on the fishing trail. Uh -huh. He's trying to get support from the Corps for a fishing trail along the, that comes up pretty close to the dam site. So you know, it required them to. I think our assistant the, manager yeah. was working on the trash yeah, wheel. Think, yeah, the trash wheel, like the Baltimore Harbor and yeah, ARPA funding yeah, to I think get a that, design for that. I, I, I understand that, that there's funding available to support that project. For the design of potentially a trash wheel like right. the Baltimore yeah. Harbor. Yeah. yeah, I heard there was some, you know, congressionally directed spending money that ARPA, could be yeah. used to support that project. So, I mean, obviously, we. <laughs> we, we support nope, moving yeah, forward yeah, yeah. on that, right? It's going to take some some uh, push, right? Somebody's got to push that forward. Right. Right. So, yeah. Good. Other, other thoughts, questions? This is very thorough. That was <coughs> my thought. And I appreciate that. And all the uh, information you're able to gather from everybody and, yeah. and breaking that down into... Micro groups as well. I appreciate it. Yeah, good. thank you. Yeah, they really it was fun. They they really took it seriously. There's, there's a lot in here. There's a lot more that uh, to squeeze out of there. So good. Uh, yeah, I appreciated how many different kinds of people filled them out. Oh, yeah. So the yeah. um, people from Main Street, people from the Ascend program. The Ascend. Um, Main Street, people who MRTC. Um, uh, Main, St Main Street, uh, MAP, the MAP groups. We'll get to area um, partners. Yeah, and then they we got put it out as a link to, on the city. The city put it out as a link, so it went out to a much broader audience. So everybody that. had a yeah. an opportunity, yes. and a lot of people yeah. wrote a lot. That's a lot right. of quotes um, for a survey. That's why I said in the you know the plan to develop a master plan, and we should we should include a. a ample opportunity for the for citizens to be involved in the, in the planning to provide, to provide input into the planning there so and a lot of great models out there right we've seen um, we were down in Chattanooga Chattanooga just did a big strategic plan Chattanooga Tennessee right yeah Chattanooga Tennessee just finished a big strategic planning process for their riverfront so there's a lot of neat um, aspirational type communities that we could learn from in, in doing a master plan. So I really appreciate council's support to, um, you know, pushing, uh, pushing on, on doing a master plan for the riverfront, you know, integrated with the comprehensive plan and the downtown plan and connections with downtown and the neighborhoods. But, but I think it needs focus. The riverfront needs focus. It tends to be too much sort of opportunistic planning and and all that more integrated strategic planning for the riverfront. <coughs> so that's what we need to work on. Great. All right. Thanks. Thank you. Thank thanks, Steve. Yeah, I don't think there's ever there's been like a student landscape architecture that did a plan at one point, but I don't think we've ever had a actual waterfront plan. Hmm. So 
it would mm -hmm. be neat to both work on the plan with Main Street and the Wharf District, but also to do something that covered the breadth. All length, yep. So, on to the next thing. So now we have, this is a specific public hearing. This is um, an ordinance amending fiscal year 2023-2024 uh, annual budget of the city of Morgantown as shown in the revised budget attached here too and made a part of this ordinance as the same applies to the general fund. So this is, if you have comments, um, just regarding the annual, uh, the ordinance <coughs> amending the annual budget. If you're wanting to speak just on this item, this is your moment. If you want to speak on something else, the public portion comes a little bit later. So we're gonna close this. <laughs> then we're going to um, go to uh, item 7, unfinished business. This is a consideration of approval of the Ruby Summer Concert Series Catering Event Permit. And asking, um, is this something we're asking Vincent or? Yeah, Vincent can do it. All right. So uh, before we have discussion, yes. I was going to recuse myself from okay. the discussion on this. Yes. Um, Yep, so you would probably just step outside. Yeah, I gotta go outside. <laughs> Good evening, Council. Vincent Kitch, Director of Arts and Culture Development. City Manager asked me to come maybe tonight to help answer any unresolved questions or anything that you might have. We know this has been under discussion for a couple weeks, so if there's anything I can answer or help with I'm happy to do so if you want to just for the people who are here just to give us the basic scenario what we're looking what at. we're talking about yeah yep. last year we piloted um, beer sales at the Ruby summer concert series which was something that we had planned on from the beginning we didn't take that on in the first year um, and it's not something that we the city felt like we should undertake um, given everything else that's going on and what our levels of staffing and expertise are, and we piloted that last year. This year we um, issued the RFP again for catering um, of beer sales at the park, and we received um, a couple submissions, and those submissions were reviewed by a city um, staff team that looked at both of those, scored those, and then forwarded on the recommendation. We went through a lot of trials and tribulations last year, I can tell you, because with ABCA, we worked for six months under the auspices of this idea the new catering permit would serve um, someone that wanted to get into that and literally right up until April or May they were saying yeah yeah that's it and then at the end they said no you can't do that it's public property you have to do fairs and festivals permits which means we had to rescope that whole process so now any vendor literally has to get about six or seven fairs and festivals permits to cover the entire summer because they're only good for 10 days, although that has to be done in advance. And um, each permit covers roughly two concerts the way we space it out in the summer. And so it was pilot again last year. It was very successful. I think people enjoyed the fact that that was something that we added um, to the park. And um, we reissued the RFP this year, um, and you have the results of how that process went. And, like I said, I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have or general specifics that you might wonder about. I didn't really come prepared to make a presentation. I was really just here to support you all in your decision making. Yes, yeah, so if people have specific questions. Did you want to go first? Hmm? I thought you were getting ready to talk. I can. I'm you happy to first? talk. Do you want to go first? Um, <laughs> you're not required. If you're wanting to talk, this is a good moment. When we put out the RFP, um, did we say, and please, no one take me the wrong way, I spend my money downtown, I spend my money in the city, I do not go to Suncrest Town Center, very, very, very rarely, I do not go to University Town Center, except very, very, very rarely, I spend my money in the city. That being said, in the RFP, did we say that we would give priority to businesses um, within the city 
not specifically. We, we announced it through Main Street to downtown businesses, restaurants, and bars, but there was no specific recommendation for that. That was a requirement. And do all of our food trucks, are they all based within the city or are they nope. from all over? Like they can be, they're from various places. The, the scoring, if you look at everything except for within city limits, everything was tied. Um, or the, the total scores came out tied, everything except for within city limits. And I'm not sure that that's exactly accurate. I don't think it was all tied. I think that was one indication where there was a separation, but I don't think it was exactly the same score. But they were very, having they, said that, they are very similar. They got they, seven <coughs> points for being within the city limits, and it was 208 to 215. So. Okay. If we take out if we take out proximity to city limits, they're they're tied on everything else. I attended every single one but one concert last year, and I don't know how anyone else on council feels or how they how many concerts they attended. The lines were insane, and the beverages were expensive. And I see that the other group. I I read both proposals. I asked for those two or three weeks ago when this was sent to us, and I know that those were just sent out to other council members this afternoon, apparently. Um, I didn't realize that this hadn't been sent to anyone else at that time, but it looks to me like the other company has better plans and better prices for consumers and for moving lines through. And I, I'm very concerned about the reason that Councillor Butcher had to recuse himself, and <laughs> um, which we are all aware of. But yeah, I'm I'm not thrilled with the scoring on it. Well, to clarify, last year's proposal that was submitted and accepted was very similar to the one you're referencing, and it was pretty much discovered. I think it was. Probably 4th of July before the vendor even recovered all the costs involved and it was discovered that many of the menu items were not selling um, because I think we started last year with a much more diverse and it is a business situation and so I, I do give them control to respond and they made a lot of changes I think during the course of the year but it became not feasible to offer the full gamut of activities because there wasn't there just wasn't desire and I would agree with you with the lines and that was something that we we address it it happens right around eight o'clock because once the opener finishes and there's that gap between that and the headliner every single person that's interested in doing that heads that direction and so we've been you know in our delta from last year we did talk about how there might be ways to try to speed that up and, and increase that process but that you know it there's that one time period where the lines get to be because if we have 5,000 people in the park, and you have three or you know three people down there serving beer, it's only going to move at a certain pace, and that it tends to bottleneck there. And I, you know, again, it's a business, so how many people can you afford to bring to the park at any one time, um, and and run the operation? It's a consideration that we allow the vendor to respond to. Um, we don't try to get involved in that, but we do have a pretty strong say in how kind of what products they might want to try and, and stuff, but it was it was a situation where they had to scale back some of the things they were offering. They had two trailers in the beginning and they had a whole line of seltzers and wine and some other stuff to begin and it didn't sell, so they narrowed the scope to something that was more um, saleable. And they made changes throughout the season and I think they've also proposed changes potentially for this season, but it's a, it's a market demand thing. Um, the pricing on either is, I think, affordable. We sell beer at the Metropolitan Theater at $8 a pop. Um, most concert venues are 15 or plus for just a 16-ounce beer. When the concert promoters come in, I think they're at $10. Yeah, it's, it is an expensive proposition, but then um, that's, I think it's within scale on both of these, and they were, it's, it's hard, I think it's hard to make a, it's not a windfall profit going on down there, whoever's doing the service. It's a lot of work, but. Um, that's kind of my take just from monitoring but yeah you're right the lines are challenging and I don't you know uh, I don't know what that answer is because they can't have 10 people work and I know that that would be. May I ask how many people were involved in the decision? 
How many people panel, were involved in the it decision? It should have been in the memo. There was a, a panel of three. It was Assistant City Manager Emily Mazzarelli, um, Damian Davis, Director of Engineering and Public Works, and Ricky Yeager, Director of Development Services. They, yeah. they evaluated. Okay. I facilitate only because since I had spent a year working with the one of the vend one of the respondents, I didn't I didn't want to vote myself. So I I appreciate that. There any other? My only other question. I'm sorry because I was looking yeah. through both proposals no, and I saw that I saw the one that was recommended had two trucks and then. The mason jar did not list how many trucks they had. Is there any? They have a, if I remember right, they have a six tab trailer as well, and the pop up. It's similar. Um, it's a, it's a, it's a small space. Um, we started out with the two truck possibility, and for bigger events that might help alleviate, again, some of the the line issue. I'm not sure, but it's a small space, and I chose the space. Just that was another issue that came up down there by the bridge to move it feasibly as far away from the stage and the face painting and the main crowd just because we can't handle it in the patio area it's just too congested and so that's kind of the only area in the park that made sense to have something that would involve you know 100 people in line at a time if that's where we're at but clearly i think the one thing about the line says there is a demand for it um and i think um uh, it, like i said it was it was successful it was a great trial, and so um, I think it's something that people are definitely interested in. Um, I just, you, you know, we, Ryan and I spoke in the very first year about do we want to get a license, do we want to get in the beer business, and we didn't even try it the first year because I was like, let's have incremental growth, let's not bite off more than we can chew. And after seeing that, I'm like, I don't need to be in the beer business, I'm happy just to take a nice donation because you know ten thousand dollars is what's proposed by both proposers that pays for you know half of the two fireworks shows that we do or any number of things half of our opening acts it's a it's a it's a way to raise money for the park so it's a great service i mean it looked to me like the the mason jar also offered a better selection since you brought up selection and having to i mean their proposal specifically mentioned serving or offering wine, mentioned offering non-alcoholic beer, mm -hmm. which is something that I consume so pretty regularly these days. So I liked the, the spelled out selection as well, but yeah. I wasn't yeah. asked to score. <laughs> yeah, we, again, we tried the wine, I think in the beginning of the first few weeks and last year too, it was also new. So it was, it's, it's hard to gauge. It's, it's a, uh, the project is going to develop over time. I think it's going to take time to get people used to it, just even being there. And um, I think anything is possible. We can certainly um, work with any vendor on what we want to offer or what we think. But again, it has to be kind of their business model that says, yes, this works for us. But I think both would be open to anything that we wanted to talk to them about. So, we ready to vote? Call for the question. We haven't even had a motion, I don't think. <laughs> we'll have to make a motion. I move to approve. Second. Thank you. I still have grave concerns over communications received by Councillor Butcher. Um, Councillor Butcher is not here and not voting. Understood. I think I think my my thing that would make me feel better in the interest of uh, information is these recommendations were made before he was ever communicated with, correct? Sure. The proposal, I believe, was made before anyone had emailed him. The um, recommendation. Um. So, not that he had anything to do with any of the recommendations. My concern is not impropriety on Councillor Butcher's part. I do not feel there has been any type of impropriety on Councillor Butcher's part. No, not I at believe all. the business was improper. Yeah. I, I, at best, I would say they were naive. You know, they they looked to uh, 
indicate their enthusiasms for the project and suggest that they would be willing to do anything that was required in order to be uh, considered. Um, like I said, I think that's probably naive. I think to deny them because of that would be a equally um, unfair simply because um, it's, it has no consequence. It did not affect the outcome. The decision was made prior to that. Uh, it hadn't come to council yet, but the decision was made prior to that. So I wouldn't want to. Well, the final decision lies with us, not with the scoring of staff. I just want to. <laughs> well, what I'm saying is. That's what we're deciding right now. Right. The recommendation from the staff was done well before that. I don't think we should. That's the important part. I was trying to get clarification. I don't think that should be consequential in either direction. It did not affect that email did not affect the outcome, nor should it have a, an effect on the outcome. So either you trust what has been done by administration and the way it was done and accept that, as you suggested, you weren't on that, that, uh, you weren't on that board, you didn't make that decision. <coughs> it was brought to us, now we evaluate what we think should be appropriate. Is this a one, was this, do we, I know last time Joe had discussed, is this a one year deal and then next year there'll be a new one, a new rating? Is that, Ryan, is that the case? I think you have an answer coming. Oh. Was this a one year deal and then next year we could do a new rating for the? We are not intending to have to go out for RFP. We settled all of this last year. We actually had a multi-year agreement in oh, place. Okay. And then, so it is our goal, not, it, the service doesn't require us to issue RFP, so we'd like to try to get something that we could maybe build and sustain because um, I think, you know, having, if it went out and it's a brand new vendor next year, then it's, then they're starting in brand new and trying to help build. So it's, gotcha. it's definitely a building thing. So we'd like to look at a potential renewable contract for a, a couple of years just to, build it and you said there were, you said the city there would be a cost to the city no they're paying us ten thousand they're paying you and that helps you yeah your, and we don't have to sell beer we just that's that's, that's happy to get ten thousand gotcha, dollars and gotcha. not have to be in the business of selling beer okay thank you sir yeah sure yeah and i would just add to councillor quecky's comments that the decision on this was outside of the scope of that email to councillor butcher so it was not a part of the decision process. No, I just wanted that as clarification, just for public knowledge too. I just think sometimes you learn things about who you're about to sign multi-year legal contracts with, and sometimes they're the types of people you want to do long-term business with, and sometimes they're not. But it's fine. <laughs> it's fine. I won't purchase. <laughs> um, okay. I am inclined that when um, when something has gone through a vetting process and when it comes to this at the end of the vetting process and it is um, to us that I'm more inclined to vote up or down on what is presented to us and so I'm more inclined to vote in favor of the <coughs> contract as presented. That's what I'm likely to do in this case. So are we ready to vote? All right. Please do that. Yes. Deputy Mayor of Uganam? Yes. Bill Kowecki? Yes. We see Michael? Yes. Danielle Tremble? No. <coughs> Dave Harshbarger? Yes. Mayor Celine? Yes. Passes 5 1. And we need to grab. Yes, Mr. please. Butcher. Get, okay. Thank you.
All right. We're to boards and commissions. Sorry. Yes. I have. Are there, uh, are there some? Oh, wait. Sorry. We have to wait till he comes in. Oh, yeah, of course. <laughs> Pardon. I was just okay. So, Vincent, do you ready? So, do we have some board and commission? I have one. Uh, I'd like to put forth Scott Frederick for the Historic Landmarks Commission. Second. Thank Wonderful. You. All in favor, yes, okay. Yep. Yes. We're good. I'd like to nominate Matt Cummins for the tree board. Is there a second? Yes, I'll second. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, Acclamation. Yes. Yes. Okay. Mayor, I have two nominees for the Traffic Commission. The first person is Chip Walmsley. <coughs> and I'll Sir. second for that. Thank you. By acclamation. Yes. Yes. Okay. And the second person also for the Traffic Commission is Matthew Cross. Second. Okay. By acclamation. By acclamation. Yep. All right. I believe that's for this evening mm -hmm. all right so. thank you now we're to the public portion this is the public portion which shall be subject to rules established by council and adopted by resolution and that would be that you would come to the podium and state your name and um, uh, you can watch the do we have the buttons to oh, all right <laughs> We have Councillor Butcher on the uh, the buttons the there. Buttons. Yeah. Um, be kind, <laughs> be thorough. <laughs> so when you come up, you can see when your time is getting short, and if you would just shorten up your time, and if you have a few more words, please say those, and then um, let the next next person have an have an opportunity. Do you want me to get the list? Pardon? Do you want me to get the list? Um, is there a list? Mm -hmm. um, I think Steve took yeah. when he took his paper. Oh. <laughs> ah. Wow. See, not here anymore. Um, <laughs> so that happens sometimes. So uh, why don't we sort of start up here, and if, if you were somebody that wanted to speak, we can just kind of work back this way and back this way. Yep, just come on up. Yeah, so if you would state your name. Hi, <clears throat> my name is Amanda Goddard. Um, I live in downtown Morgantown. I'm not going to take up a lot of time, but I uh, want to speak <coughs> about uh, one of uh, Morgantown's most urgent problems, in my opinion. Um, as someone who uh, frequently sees homeless people without a place to go, I uh, wanted to speak in support for expanding housing supply and uh, related services for the future. If people are resorting to unsafe environments like underpasses, streets, and parks to take shelter, um, more spaces for them need to be available to address the growing need. Um, and that's all. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. All right. We're just going to go right down the row here if there's anybody who is um, wanting to speak. And then Vincent, the person next to you, I don't know if she's wanting to speak. Okay. Then throw the Danny's in. <laughs> if Danny's willing, willing, interested in speaking. Of course. <laughs> I'm Danny Ludwig. I live at 326 Broadway Avenue. Uh, here we are again, ladies and gentlemen, for the same consecutive issue. Uh, Recently, I'm sure you are aware that we lost two unsheltered folks in a, a structure fire. Um, a structure that really should have been taken down after the first gas explosion. Uh, from what I understand, to my knowledge, is that firefighters didn't go in because they didn't believe anybody was in there. So here's my thinking on this. Um, camps are getting dismantled all the time, and I know that there's a stop line dismantling camps apparently, but camps are still being dismantled. So people are going into structures that are not safe and like this is not the first time we've lost somebody this year in a bando. And that's an issue. That's a huge issue for our population. I know that homelessness is stigmatized, but like we are humans and we need to treat everybody like a human being. 
You know, I know Morgantown wants to complain about the homeless population, but what are we really doing about it? Bartlett is not taking any clients right now. They may not even be open next year or the rest of the year, let's say. So people are resorting to, to bandos, which is not safe. So what I would like to see happen, and it's been talked about a little bit, is a managed camp where all the hubs of service can come and connect people to housing, treatment, whatever they need to do. There's a bunch of us that work for nonprofit organizations that can come there and be there 24 seven around the clock. We've done this before and unfortunately it wasn't a complete success, but everybody that was there got housed. So it was a huge success in my eyes. But I mean, like we're gonna lose more people if we don't do something about this. People don't wanna camp because their, their stuff's getting thrown away. So like, where do we send them? We don't have affordable housing here in Morgantown. The low income housing, if you've ever been in it, the only thing that's holding them up is a cockroach is moving around. So like, you know, that's not a safe place for people to be either, to be quite honest. But we as a community that have different hubs of organizations that have services need to come together and find a solution before somebody else gets their life taken away from a structure fire. You know, I mean, I don't know, I don't know, I don't have all the answers, but I'm willing to come to the table and figure it out. Because people that I care about are dying all the time. And again, this is not the first homeless person or people that have died in structures this year. This is the fourth we've had this year in a bando. Like, what are we, what are we doing as a city? Complaining? That's what we're doing. What about a solution? We need a solution together. We can't, I can't do this alone. People that are here with me that are advocating for this cause, we can't do this alone. We have to do this together. And we need people to come to the table and figure it out. Because I'm tired of burying people that I care about. And this, this is a lot. This means a lot to me and a lot of other people. You know, so like we need to do something. A, a community that talks about all inclusive, then let's do it. I can't really, I can't stress that enough. I cannot. I don't even want to do my job anymore because it's so fucking heartbreaking. Excuse my language. It is. It's so sad. I've been doing this for almost six years. And it, I'm still fighting the same fight. Constantly. But we need to do something together. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else in that row that wants to speak? Yeah. I'm Jennifer Powell, and I also work with this population. And I just want to say I love them. I don't want to lose any more either. Um, we've got to come together and find a solution. I'm willing to help any way that I can. Um, but Danny's right. We, those of us that are already doing it can't do it alone. We need the city's help. We need the help from the people that hate them. We need everybody to come together. And I'll tell you, working with them, even with addiction issues, even with mental health issues, I just love them. I also work in another position with drunk college kids. I drive Uber, and they drive me nuts. I'd rather work with homeless people experiencing mental health or addiction issues any day. They're kinder, they're sweeter, They've, they've got some kind of light shining out of their eyes despite their issues. Everybody does though. Everybody's got something redemptive in them and if we keep them alive long enough, they've got so much potential. These people are mostly young too. A lot of them are fresh out of high school. Some have been to college, some have degrees. It's crazy what addiction will do to people or mental health or poverty. And, and we really do need better affordable housing. Um, I, I've, I've, got, I've got, I lost a brother in, in affordable housing that was terrifying. And my family wanted to seek that person out and get that shut down, but we were afraid of more homelessness because there's so little places that are affordable. It's, it's very big of a problem and we need a community center, we need somewhere where the youth are, have got something to look forward to in their day. 
to where they don't turn to something to do that is destructive like drugs. I mean, it's just, there's so much, there's so many pieces to this problem where we really need to work together as a community. But um, tearing down encampments is terrible. Slicing tents and taking exactly what they need and leaving the garbage, what's the point in that? Um, yeah. Some of the, the treatment of our homeless population and the views of people in the community, it's, it's terrible. They're humans and we, we, just, we just love them and we want you guys to love them too and we want everybody to work together on this because we're not going to find a way out without it. We're not going to have a clean river bank for everybody to enjoy without solving this, but just slicing up tents isn't going to fix it. That's my piece. So is there anyone in the back row that's wishing to speak? No. Oh, someone in the third row. My name is Amanda Huffman and I live at 984 Willie Street. And I um, work with the population of unhoused um, people in recovery and people in active addiction. And um, there's clearly a disconnect between the community and the unhoused, which is disheartening, but also people don't understand what they don't know, right? So if they've never really experienced these things, how would they truly understand what any of these people go through? Um, you know, I lived on house for a really long time, um, and I have years of recovery and, you know, I'm in college and I have my kids and all of these things are good and well in my life, but the only reason that I'm here is because I lived in a community where people fed me and they clothed me and they gave me water and they treated me like a human being and they saw me when I didn't see myself. So... The only solution that I can really see in this situation is if, you know, the community comes together and, and helps. And in other places in the U.S., cities have come together literally as a treatment model. Um, the businesses, the doctors, um, housing is all in unison in trying to help people who suffer from substance use disorder or mental health diagnosis because they're humans and they matter. Um, you know, we're not supposed to go through life alone. We're not meant to as humans. Part of the reason that we grow and we learn and we love is from others. So, um, you know, the opposite of addiction is human connection. And I think um, people dying alone hiding in the woods or in a burning building because they felt like no one cared um that's very sad to me and i hope that you know my kids and other kids their age never have to experience that feeling that people feel today in 2024 thank you So when anyone else wishing to speak in that sort of back corner? Hello, my name is Erin Shelton. I am here to uh, speak in support for Danny's idea of a managed camp. Um, I know that the response to the suggestion from a lot of people is going to be that this isn't the best way to address homelessness, but a lot of the other ways that we all work to address homelessness every day. Um, we're running into a lot of barriers um, to helping folks in those ways. Um, so I work with the unhoused population every day as well. Um, there are you know, people on the streets that I consider some of my dearest friends and loved ones, um, you know, and I've met people through this work who have become like my family, and it hurts my heart to know that other people, you know, see them and can only think of them as an inconvenience to the rest of us. Um, because the safety of the people in our community is our responsibility. 
Um, and they are on the streets because we have failed them. We have failed them during so many vulnerable mo moments in their life when they had to interact with the child welfare system, the public school system, the criminal justice system, and we're still failing them now. Every single time someone walks past an unhoused individual on the street and sees them as an inconvenience instead of someone who has experienced unimaginable trauma that needs our help. <clears throat> We have disabled folks out here suffering and dying because no one cares enough to take care of them and they can't take care of themselves. We have people burning to death in fires and abandoned buildings because they don't have a safe place to lay their head, not even outside. In a perfect world, every single one of us would find it in our hearts to take these people into our homes, show them love, and meet their basic needs. But since we don't live in that world, the next best thing would be at least having enough shelter beds for those experiencing homelessness in our community. But we don't have that right now, and in fact, we've never been further from that. We have many more individuals experiencing homelessness than we have shelter beds in this town. <clears throat> so if individuals, organizations, and political entities in this city cannot come together and care for those who need our help, the least we can do is allow them to care for themselves and each other in the best way they know how without criminalizing them, running them off, destroying their campsites, and trashing their belongings. Homelessness is a moral and policy failure, and if we can't come up with a better solution, the least you can do is give them a safe place to exist. So is there anyone else on this side of the room that was wishing to speak? Okay. I don't know who on this side of the room wishes to speak, but this would be your... Sean Smith, I live on 207 PR Bay Lane. Um, uh, thank you all for, for what you do for the unhoused. It's, uh, it's big. I, I came today uh, to just let everyone know and introduce myself. I'm Sean Smith. I'm running for the Board of Education here in Montegalia County. It really hit me hard a few a few months ago when I was at a board meeting and I understood that in our county, county-wide, we have 270 kids who are considered homeless and that is near and dear to my heart. And after that, uh, we took in consideration running for Board of Education and here we are, uh, and here we are taking that leap. So born and raised here in the area. My wife is uh, from Westover, so down on the river she was born and raised. We have two daughters, which is why I spend all my time in, uh, in, in, on High Street. I have one daughter who is 10 who plays volleyball. They, they use the gym up here at the church on the corner and I have another daughter who spends her life at the Met in the Morgantown Theater Company. So you can see me selling tickets and selling flowers out front for all of the events at the Met and the wonderful people there at Morgantown Theater Company and thank Heath and Sterling for all the work they do. Um, met my wife here at West Virginia University. I got an industrial engineering degree. I serve on many boards and committees throughout the throughout the county. One that I'm very, very, very proud of is a source. It's a 501C where we feed the kids at um, Skyview Elementary. We give backpacks to all the kids who are go hungry during the weekends. So we now it's been going on for many years now, and we probably um, I think we pack almost a thousand backpacks every single week to give to the kids. So I think there are things we can do outside of just sitting in a board meeting and, and doing things for education. We got to remember that these kids can't come and learn because of the situations that they find themselves in. Now, homeless is there's different definitions of that. Not unhoused, they could be in different living situations. But I think there's a lot of opportunity there. So. Um, I was speaking the other day, I have a mentor and a good friend of mine that everyone in the room probably knows, Charlene Marshall, and her and I were spending some time at her house the other day, and we were talking about city council and, and all the time that she had spent and doing things in the community, and I said, I, this is the one place I haven't been yet, so I wanted to come and introduce myself and thank you all for, for serving in our county and all that you do. Um, we've received a lot of local support from local businesses and other people, and, and we appreciate that, and we'd appreciate your support as, as we do this, and thank you for for serving our community. So the biggest thing you can do on May 14th is get out there and vote. I didn't say you had to vote for me, but get out there and vote because it's extremely, extremely important. We have people in our, uh, on our boards for education and, and House of Delegates and many other things that are going on. It's important that we get out there and vote. So thanks again. Thank you. Thank you. So sort of the next row back, if there's anyone who's wishing to speak. And then anybody else on this side, whoever would like to come in. So 
sorry, but I'm back. <laughs> Andy Cronin, York, 7th Ward, Human Rights Commission Chair. I earlier mentioned that there's a Spring Fair Housing Conference that's being held in Morgantown. I looked it up. It is on April 18th, 2024, from 8.30 until 4.30, or from 9 until 6, depending on which entry you believe on their webpage. But it's being held by the West Virginia Human Rights Commission at the Marriott Waterfront. Their web address is hrc.wv.gov. And the sad part is it costs $75 to get in. Unless you want a special lunch and it's an extra $4. But still, it, it's meant to be uh, educational for landlords, tenants, uh, businesses, anybody who has any interest in housing, which is everybody, uh, to come and find out what's going on with the law and what rights and duties there are. I also mentioned that April is a special month for many different things. It is Arab American Heritage Month. It is Autism Awareness, Celebrate Diversity, Earth Month, National Child Abuse Prevention Month, and National Volunteer Month. I can't read my writing, what? Um, <coughs> the diversity, the uh, Leadership Studies Program and Native American Studies Program at WVU are conducting a human rights film series. There's only one left because I wasn't here last time. Uh, it's being held on the 10th of April from 7 to 9 p.m. in G. G 20 Min Sai, Sai Hall, the one across the walking bridge from the B&E school, I hear. Uh, there's a, it's about uh, Native American women who are involuntarily sterilized up until recently by the U.S. government and its facilities, either hospitals or orphanages, uh, but there's thousands of them who were and it wasn't just Native Americans, but this film speaks to the Native American experience. Um, the next Human Rights Commission meeting is April 18th at 6.30 at the Public, Surf Public Safety Building. And anybody who'd like to be a commissioner is asked to please come to one of our meetings first to see if you like us or not. <laughs> Don't want to waste anybody's time. Um, as for Sexual Assault Awareness Month, the Human Rights Commission of Morgantown is charged with taking care of veterans' rights as well as several others, but that's one of our exclusive jurisdictions as veterans. And the U.S. military has been doing a great deal with Sexual Assault Awareness Month because the numbers being reported in the military of sexual assault, both to men and women, mostly by their fellow uh, officers and military members, are astounding. And in 2012, 2008, I believe, a study was done, and so 90% of the people who made complaints about sexual assault were discharged after making the complaint. So we're turning that around, hopefully. In 2016, there's the uh, Ferguson Exam Kit Law, 18 U.S.C. 3772, which requires that all victims of sexual assault be given a rape kit free of cost, administered by a hospital, free of cost, that they are entitled to a copy of the report, and the rape kit must be cut for 20 years, unless state law says less. Something lame to me. Uh, they have the right to notification of the results and written notification prior to the destruction of rape kits. Emergency rooms, semi-separate subject, are required to screen by statute for domestic violence under JACO and the ACA and a few other federal statutes. WVU Hospital has removed all of its information about domestic violence. And as one frequents the place, frequently, they used to have, put a little blue stick on the bottom of your urine cup if you're experiencing domestic violence or if you're in trouble at home. Those are all gone. All of the posters that mention domestic violence are all gone. And not a single question is asked when you walk in the door at triage if you're do you feel safe at home? You think they do is, do you feel safe at home? And just let go of that. They're not screening for domestic violence. And that's not anything city council can fix, but I would just like to make people aware of that and ask that the hospital please get back in their game. Thank you. Um, my trash didn't get picked up this week. <laughs> <laughs> Did 
Thank you. Is there anyone else wishing to speak? I missed the original call. Oh, please you go ahead. Show your one. <laughs> Hi, uh, I'm Lindsay. I live in Danielle's district um, up in Woodburn. I don't really know where to start. Um, raise your hand if you're here because you think homeless people in Morgantown should be treated like people with souls, living, breathing, more, more humanity. There's a lot of us and we're just starting. We're just getting organized. So I think it's good for y'all to know that and see that because sometimes I see kind of blank stares <laughs> coming from the dice up here. Um, I, Jen, like, I just love you. I just met Jen for the first time last week. I um, got to spend lunch at the Red Door with some potential plaintiffs. And um, they're just these beautiful people. I, we, my, my young, my baby social workers um, were there with me. And after one experience, oh, two, they did a day out with the Coalition and Homelessness, but they're both like now thinking this might be work that they wanna do because they were so moved by the people that we met. And they're really, um, I don't wanna speak on their behalf, they might be watching, but really horrified by the way that we talk about um, these folks, um, by the way we treat them. The folks I talk about, they know how we talk about them in this town. They're not dumb. Um, imagine being so like publicly loathed and what that does to you as a person. Um, I really think we should all like sit with that more often because it's it's um, it's really heartbreaking. Uh, we met a guy, um, I'll call him Johnny, and you know he lost his wife four years ago. They'd been married for about 20 years, I think is what he said. Um, and that loss, like he just said, has wrecked him. And so it's like just him and his dog, and they lived in an encampment um, for quite some time across the bridge in Westover that Morgantown police helped the railroad tear down about two weeks ago without notice. Um, some of the folks had been there for years. Um, he hadn't, but he'd definitely been there long enough for y'all to follow your own policy about notification before tearing down an encampment. Um, but yeah, he was this beautiful guy and he's like been through trauma that I think, I mean, I've experienced loss. I imagine many of you all have as well. And um, I've been really close to the brink. And so I think it's really easy for, you know, I think you all spoke about it much more eloquently than I can, but we're all very close, much closer to these folks than we think we are. Um, and I think we forget that. I um, think there's a real void of leadership on this issue. I wanna commend Councilman, Co Councilwoman Trumbull and Councilman Butcher. I see your names most often. I see you doing the work most often. And I want you both to know that I really appreciate you. Um, you all should be meeting these folks. You should be talking to them individually. You should be at the red door having lunch with them and hearing their stories and learning about them and their lives because it changes you forever. You, you don't come back from it. I don't know how y'all do the work. Like God bless you because how could you do the work? Um, day in and day out. Uh, but when you all don't speak on the issue, what that creates is this back room, vacuum where horrible Facebook groups <laughs> spread misinformation. Um, I mean, they're, they're essentially terrorists. They terrorize one of your own, and there's just nothing from you guys, nothing. Why? <laughs> you owe this to those folks because they're people who live here. Whether you like it or not, they're our neighbors. They're citizens just like I am of Morgantown and they deserve your respect, and they deserve you to work for them the same way you would work for any of us. And so I'm really disappointed in that void of leadership of which all of you are a part. Um, yeah, and I, and I guess the, I only have 16 seconds left, but you know, I live here, I love them. You're right, you can't, Jen's right, you can't, you can't talk to them and not love them. Um, and I hope to continue doing the work. I hope we continue to get organized. And I'm just so proud of all the folks that are here tonight speaking on behalf of our unhoused neighbors. Thanks. Thank you. And is there anyone else? Yes, please. There's plenty of time for everybody. <laughs> uh, forgive me. I didn't actually come here planning to speak, but I was moved. Thank you. I can't make everyone care, and I'm certainly not going to solve a stigma in two minutes, four minutes, less, but I would hope that you would consider for a moment, and I think we can all care, 
when we realize that sometimes these people are born into a houseless situation, that these are children. When you take away their safety net, there is absolutely nothing that they can do or could have done. And there's something about that that isn't fair. Most people in America are living paycheck to paycheck and are one misfortune away from houselessness. That's you, that's your neighbors, that's a lot of people in this room. And I do believe that the most basic reason that everyone came to this room on either side of this podium is because we do care about this community and we do care about each other. And this is an issue that has no easy or clear solution, but because this is a room of people who care, I would ask everyone to look to the people who are already working with these communities, who see this problem every day, who knows, who know what works, what doesn't, and can steer us in that direction toward an even better solution. And I would ask that you not let the perfect be the enemy of the good. Let us do what we can now, please. Uh, hey everybody, my name is Leslie Nash. I live at 416 Park Street and I do think I've met everyone at City Council at this point. Um, so like many or most of the people here for the public portion tonight, um, I've come to make some comments about the, the situation that Morgantown has found itself in with our unhoused neighbors. Um, a lot of you have had to hear me speak at multiple city council meetings over the last couple of months, um, and the conversation has been pretty similar each time. Um, again, I, I am not one of our service providers who works directly with our unhoused neighbors on a day-to-day -day basis, so I'm not going to try to step on their toes and say things that they've already said, and again, better than I could. Um, homelessness is a crisis for the people who are in it. Um, but most communities, including ours, treat it as a crisis for the people who have to see it as if that's the worst thing that could ever happen to us. Um, having to see someone going through a mental health crisis or having to see someone who has lost their job and lost their home, again, it makes us feel bad and we don't like that. Um, and again, as a crisis, it's, it's one that has a pretty proven solution at this point. There are literal decades of research from countries and cities all over the world um, showing that the only thing that works is housing first, low barrier, no barrier, housing first, taking people as they are, regardless of mental health status, regardless of health, regardless of age, regardless of gender or sexuality, regardless of whether or not you have a substance use disorder of any kind. That is what everybody has known for 20 or 30 years. Um, and yet we continue to find ourselves in a situation where the responses to this crisis that we attempt are criminalization, pushing people out, removing encampments, increasing enforcement against people who have nowhere to go, and creating shelters that do have high barriers and low capacity, which is why we are in the situation we are in. Um, and when it all comes down to it, the fact of the matter is that regardless of how people personally feel about it, Everyone has to live somewhere. Are they are going to die in public and in abandoned buildings and in parks and in forests and in the river and where this is going to keep happening? Because we, again, as a community, have been unwilling to devote the resources that it takes to actually provide the proven solution to this crisis and have been unwilling to muster the courage to do it in the face of a few <sighs> vocal members of the community who have decided that posting pictures of homeless people on Facebook is acceptable, which it is absolutely not. Um, so, you know, again, I've said this before, I'll probably get to come up here and say it again. Um, but at the end of it all, you know, I, I think coming back to what other people have said, the only way that we get out of this is by actually caring for each other. And none of this works until we come to an understanding that each of these lives is just as precious as our own. Um, there's a, a great quote by Ruth Gilmore Wilson. It's one of the great abolitionists of our age. You know, where life is precious, life is precious. And I think that's really the approach that we need to take here, or we're going to keep doing this again and again and again until more people die. Um, so thank you for your time. Thank you. Hi. 
I'm Sid McGinnis. I'm a law student here in my second year at WVU. And I tell you that not to try to give you guys any kind of false sense of authority on my part, but to make it clear to you that not just unhoused care workers or people that care about this, there are multiple groups of people who want the unhoused issue fixed and want to see those movements forward from you all. Um, these people are people's kids, they're their parents, they're their brothers, they're their sisters. They aren't some faceless person that you're never going to see again. They're an actual human being that needs help. And as far as what's causing the problem, it's not as simple as getting over an addiction or getting a job. Um, getting over an addiction requires help, aid, assistance, rehabilitation, and if they can't afford housing, how exactly do you expect them to afford rehab? And beyond that, with getting a job, I don't know if any of you guys have been in the job market recently, but it's next to impossible and incredibly impossible to find one that pays you a living wage and gives you the ability to take care of yourself, to afford anything, let alone housing. And I just want to pose this for you guys, that if the roles were reversed, if any one of you were in these situations, if you hadn't gotten the luck and the treatment and the help that you've gotten that's led you to where you sit today before all of us, and you were in their shoes, you would be petrified, terrified of your life, terrified going through every day and absolutely desperate for the compassion of others. So think, please just think about that going forward on this, like if you were in their shoes, you would be just as desperate for help and compassion and in need of it as they are. Thank you. Here. Is there anyone else wishing to speak? I didn't come here to speak tonight. I don't live in Morgantown, but I want to introduce you to the homeless population. I was one. Um, I do fair housing at the Fairmont Morgantown Housing Authority. I'm a housing advocate. And when I got that job, I was homeless. I was couch surfing. Um, we are one paycheck away. Only one. Some less. I went to a shelter because the only reason I knew about it was because I had a job interview there. I came to get this Fair Housing Proclamation late. And apparently there was a reason I was to come late. I want you to look at what homeless look like. That's my game. <clears throat> I had a fair housing town hall meeting at the um, Wells Hills Community Center last Thursday. There were three items on that list as far as impediments that the community members who came wanted to address, and, and they resound in my head, six, nine, and one, right? <laughs> um, and one of those things was a, a sense of community that was missing. Mm -hmm. And as I sit here today and I listen to those <clears throat> members who work with the unhoused populations, of which I have been one as recently as two and a half years ago. I um, see that there's a sense of community that's missing in this city, and it's unfortunate. And that's, that lack thereof was mentioned in a fair housing meeting. How are we going to make affordable housing? How are we going to make it accessible for those who want to age in place, for those who may be downsizing because their kids went to college? And it's got to start with a sense of community and a sense of ownership. What I asked for those individuals was to write an index card for me, an action step they were willing to take. It sounds like the action step means to, means to, be, to meet your neighbor. That's all I have to say. And you're going you're gonna to get your proclamation, because Annie, right behind you, And you all should meet your neighbor behind. I don't know if you know each other, but she received it for you guys. So. Is there anyone else wishing to speak? Connie Banta. Um, two weeks ago, 
I moved my daughter and her family from Jacksonville, Florida back to Morgantown. She grew up here her whole life, went to WVU, Foundation Scholar, moved to Jacksonville, Florida, has a two-year-old daughter and is pregnant now. She moved back to West Virginia and back to Morgantown because she said, Mom, I need a village. I need a village. She has one with us, my husband and myself and her husband's parents. That's not enough. I want her to live in a community that is a village. I want her, I, my vision is that she live in a place where people take care of each other. That people have enough food, that the people have shelter, and that people can live safely. We all need a village. And people aren't gonna move back. To, you know, these are professional folks. My daughter and her husband. And they left a lot in Florida to be here. And if they can't feel like they're living in a community that is, is humane and takes care of its own people, they're not gonna stay. Let's make a village. there anyone else? All right. Now we're to the consent agenda. Item 10. Um, so the cons consent Consent agenda we vote on um, as is unless somebody has a consideration and they would like to remove it from the consent agenda. So I'm going to read through it and then we will have a motion and then we will pass whatever remains on the consent agenda. So item A is consideration of approval of a second reading of an ordinance amending the fiscal year 2023-2024 annual budget of the city of Morgantown as shown in the revised budget attached here too and made a part of this ordinance as the same applies to the general fund. The first reading was third month, 19th day of 24. Uh, and then item B in the consent agenda is consideration of approval of first reading of an ordinance updating the codified ordinances of the city of Morgantown, West Virginia. And is there a motion? Um, can we remove item B from the consent agenda? Sure, that's, that's your I just your had some questions. So. Yep. Um, so then remaining on the consent agenda is, should we have a second on that? I don't know if we, do we need a Any city attorney? Yeah, just can just one person can take it off, is that correct? So, okay. Move to approve the consent agenda with just item A. Thank you. Second. Uh, we have a second? Right. Okay, right. I'm sorry, missed that. All right. If we would please call, um, please call the roll. Yes, Deputy Mayor Abu Ghanim. Yes. Bill Kowecki. Yes. Weezy Michael. Yep. Danielle Trumbull. Yes. Dave Harshbarger. Yes. Brian Butcher. Yes. <coughs> Mayor Celine. Yes, Pattis is unanimously. And now um, we could, then we can just, can we consider then item be on its own? Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. Okay. So now we would consider um, the approval of the first reading of an ordinance updating the codified ordinances of the city of Morgantown, West Virginia. And is there a motion um, Move to, to consider this? Pardon? Move to approve. Second. Thank you. And then um, is this something that we would perhaps ask our city attorney? Uh, why are we doing this? What is it? <laughs> uh, Mayor and Council, this is uh, an ordinance that uh, is a, uh, a kind of administrative action by Council. This adds to the published city code, the uh, ordinances themselves that have been adopted by City Council over the past uh, period of time, depending on how often the recodification is done. So uh, the city uses a publisher, currently Municode, to uh, publish a what's called a codified version of the ordinances you all pass as council 
and that's a publicly accessible version of the city's laws so that it's organized nicely and available to the public members of council and others to review those laws um, this ordinance will authorize and direct the publisher to include those adopted ordinance in the codified version of your laws that are published so the ordinances were already passed but now they're in the codified version okay for how many years are we going back i am not certain okay these are uh historically the the publisher has usually provided these uh, twice annually i think the city has used different time periods over the years okay I was just wondering what we were doing thank you yes it's a very good question when you haven't seen that very much before no. so call for the question all right Deputy Mayor Bugonham yes Bill Kowalki? Yes. Weezy Michael? Yes. Daniel Trumbull? Yes. Dave Harshbarger? Yes. Brian Butcher? Yes. Mayor Celine? Yes. Passes unanimously. Now we're under new business. Item A, consideration of approval of the first reading of an ordinance amending the private outdoor designated areas in the city of Morgantown. And um, ask our city attorney if he would um, explain what's included here. Thank you, Mayor. This ordinance is a proposed update to the ordinance city council adopted a couple of months ago establishing a private outdoor designated area under the legislation passed in 2023. State legislature updated that authorizing law, uh, this just concluded regular session uh, to make uh, a couple changes and, and this ordinance is intended to track those as well as to make one uh, proposed change to the, the committee that will review applications of participants. So the, the legislation that passed, it was um, House Bill 5295, uh, expanded the uh, types of businesses that can participate in private outdoor designated areas, uh, specifically to ensure that fair and festival permits can be held within the, the POTA area. While the POTA is still ongoing, that was previously prohibited by uh, the original law. The, the law of the past also uh, noted that any Class A, Class B, or Class S2, and Class S2 is a, a fair and festival permit, licensee can apply to get a permit, but um, apparently because of how the definition of qualified permit holder was uh, was changed in the version passed by the Senate, uh, those licenses only remain available to licensees that have a what's called a private club license under Chapter 60, Article 7. So uh, basically those bars and restaurants that are able to serve liquor. Um, we sent the, uh, the proposed update to ABCA and, and talked with their, their council and their um, local representative about this issue. Um, and uh, also talk to uh, at, at least one local legislator. So uh, hopefully that's something they'll, uh, they'll see if they can address. It, it looks like the legislator, legislature intended to expand access to different business types. That's something that the, the city council and Main Street Morgantown worked on um, and, and I think was the intent of the legislature, but uh, maybe didn't happen with the, the way the law ended up being passed. This ordinance does uh, list those expanded license types and would allow anybody with a, a class a license to apply through the city process but um, there may not be an option to get the actual permit issued by abca unless you have a liquor license um, probably the the bigger change and the one that was more central to all of our businesses that talked to main street and, um, and city council about participating is the law removes the joint and several liability requirements so Bars and restaurants that participate will not have to enter an agreement that says they are jointly and severally liable for any uh, any license violations. That was uh, that was a big concern among our business community and and has been removed by the the bill the legislature passed. So those changes are included in this update. The other proposed change is to add a staff member to the committee that reviews applications locally. 
um, the uh, city staff requested that addition so that they could communicate with the committee members about uh, the the business requirements or characteristics licensure with the city um, any any violations or other issues uh, so uh, this will also take effect on the prior effective date uh, May 15th and uh, if you have any questions about the ordinance text I'd be happy to address those move to approve Second. Thank you. Now I have a question. Please. <laughs> Get right in there. So you said that we're leaving the additional license types in this ordinance. If, if by chance the state changes this during an interim or special session, um, we won't have to make any additional updates to ours? I think that's right. I mean, it would depend on the change. But wrong. yes, that um, if, if this were expanded to effectively allow all Class A licensees to participate, then you, you wouldn't need to change this ordinance. Uh, and certainly, if Council would like to, to change this version to specifically track the way state law is now, I can prepare that update. Um, we did get other review comments from ABCA about handling uh, fairs and festivals and things, so we, we may have additional follow-up work later anyway. And do we know which um, city staff position will be serving on the committee? Uh, as drafted in the ordinance, it's just a uh, designee of the city manager. Okay. With the removal of joint and severability, sever whatever it is, mm -hmm. uh, severable uh, liability, Several. What? how does liability work now? My understanding is that it will be the same as it is for any operator. So the, the joint and several liability provision was with respect to violations of, that are enforced by ABCA. So if there's a violation now, I think it would have to be traced back to the, the particular licensee. And so your recommendation is that we leave Class A in at this time in hopes that the legislature changes that back? Uh, I don't think that, uh, I don't think that does any real harm here. The, the only thing is we should make clear to people who apply that unless they do have the ability to serve liquor, they may not be able to get the actual Class S4 <laughs> permit from ABCA. And so just, that if, that, if that may cause confusion, we can provide an amendment. In our application process, will we make that known to the people Just applying? The application. Mm -hmm. We can certainly. Or are we that. taking on all comers? Uh, we can, we can include that uh, a notice. the The city is working on a web page to kind of <coughs> compile all this information, as well as with, uh, they've already drafted an, an application and a, a permit form. There's a, a staff working group that meets tomorrow afternoon. So <coughs> I can bring that up with them. Very good. So where are we? Just when we thought we had a question. It. So close. I think we're to that point. <laughs> Time for the question. Yeah. Deputy Mayor Buganum? Yes. <clears throat> Bill Kowecki? Yes. Weezy Michael? Yes. Danielle Trumbull? Yes. Dave Harshbarger? Yes. Brian Butcher? Yes. Mayor Celine? Yes. Passes unanimously. Item B, consideration of approval of a resolution authorizing requests for congressionally directed spending for Morgantown Fire Station Training Facility and for Downtown Historic Revitalization Subgrant Program and ask our city manager. Thank you, Mayor, the City Council. Um, the, the city's been very active over the last number of years in applying for and securing some pretty significant grants that has helped us through the COVID era, but also has helped us uh, uh, step up uh, some of the other programs that uh, uh, Council has directed uh, that we establish. This this is no different. Uh, this is kind of the, the time of year that uh, it's, a, it's a grant cycle for uh, congressional directed spending and our, uh, our uh, uh, wonderful grant writer has, has been very active in, in making sure that the city is represented in, in trying to secure some of these funds. Uh, the, 
the current proposal is that uh, uh, we apply for and we're asking for for council uh, support on this uh, in the form of a resolution uh, that two million dollars be uh, proposed and, and and be authorized to to be applied for for the establishment and funding of um, downtown historic district uh, revitalization uh, subgrant program which uh, basically allows um, the city to enter into agreements with uh, downtown business owners, uh, nonprofits, um, businesses, building owners, and so forth uh, for renovation and restoration of historical of historical uh, historic buildings and street streetscape design improvements. So that's one. The overall goal, obviously, is to protect and preserve the historic nature of the downtown. The, the second portion uh, uh, of, of the grant application would be a $4 million request that uh, would allow for uh, fire station expansion. As you know, we're in the middle of, we've received some funding for the, the construction of the new fire station, uh, and uh, we were close to completing the purchase of the, the property there. Um, as we've gone through the design process, uh, the, the original in, uh, amount that we applied for is, is far below what, what the expected cost is going to be. And we all know what, what's happened with the costs over time. So it, it is uh, it's the recommendation that uh, $4 million be applied for that particular fire station. But uh, in addition for the expansion, uh, including uh, training rooms, training uh, training mezzanine, expansion of the apron and parking lot for training purposes. That would help kind of uh, flesh out the uh, a pretty good portion of the balance of the cost of that project. Any questions? Move to approve. Megan. Thank you. Any questions? The deadline was extended, so you decided to sneak a few more in there? Yes. Yeah. I like That's it. a good thing, right? <laughs> I like that yeah, thought, yeah. yeah. <laughs> they couldn't right. pass a budget, so they ended um, I, I did have one question. And just, um, do you have, uh, you probably don't yet, but do you have any kind of ideas on exactly how we're, the $2 million, how, is that just more of an expansion of the kind of grants we had done before with ARPA dollars, or... Is that what you're thinking with that? Or? Yes, but there there will be have to be a process in place for the allocation of those mm -hmm. dollars and for tracking those dollars uh, that they meet the intent of the, of the grant program. Okay. It's in addition to the ARPA dollars that you're talking about, sure. Are we ready? Mm -hmm. All right. Please. Deputy Mayor Bugonum? Yes. Bill Kowecki? Yes. Weezy Michael? Yes. Danielle Trumbull? Yes. Dave Harshbarger? Yes. Brian Butcher? Yes. Mayor Celine? Yes. Passes unanimously. City Manager's Report. Thank you again, Mayor. Uh, some of you have had the opportunity to, to visit the renovated City Hall building. I. Uh, I, I hope you're as impressed as I am with how well that has turned out. This was a an old building that has been added on and added on for, for many years, and I think that the the work that uh, our our consultant and and our city staff has done in terms of space utilization, in order to accommodate the the, the services that the city provides, I think is pretty remarkable. Uh, it's it's really presents well, it represents who we are, I think, and and I think people going there to do business with the city is going to feel comfortable going. I uh, just wanted to uh, let you know that the actual move-in started yesterday All right. uh, and continued today. That's one reason that our, our finance director wasn't here today. He was in the middle of, of moving. Um, so we're anticipating that that move will continue over the next uh, couple of weeks, but um, I, I can tell you our staff is very excited. Uh, uh, the other thing I would remind you of is that uh, April 15th at 3 o'clock, the Norwood Fire Station project uh, will be presented, and there will be a, 
a ceremony uh, would invite all of you to attend. While you're there, I, you might be interested in, in uh, climbing up on, well, maybe not, but, but uh, at least walking around our new, uh, new ladder truck that was recently delivered to us. Uh, it's a great piece of equipment and I think will, will help serve our community well over the next many years. That's all I have at this time, Mayor. Thank you. And we might add the uh, renovated fire station. <clears throat> The, the baby box. We're doing. We're opening the baby box. Yes, that's all at, at three o'clock on the fifteenth. Yes. Yeah. Is that new fire truck living in Norwood Station? For currently? now, yeah. Mm -hmm. That's where it will be. So it'll be available for whatever you want to do. You want to take a ride on it? You're welcome to do that too. <laughs> you're making a lot of promises. I'm going to have to check <laughs> the guys. Over I will there. not be driving it. Though. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Report from the city clerk. Uh, yes, Mayor. I just want to remind folks uh, how they can be notified of things that are going on in the city, uh, such as getting on a list to receive an agenda or minutes, um, emergency alerts, things like that. So really quick, if you go to our city's website at morgantownwv.gov, there is a search, search field and it says, how can we help you? So if you click in there and you type in notify me, notify me will pop up and you just select that and there uh, is a way you put your email address in there or a or a phone number cell phone number and you can select under agenda center that you would like to have the bicycle board um, agenda or minutes or city council or building commission you could also select that you would like to be alerted of any emergency alerts or um, bid postings for construction, engineering, fire department, things like that. Uh, calendar, news flashes, <coughs> all of that is on our website and it's pretty easy. Just select how you would like to be notified and every time uh, someone posts something on our, on our city's website, then you will need, be notified. It's very handy. So again, go to morgantownwv.gov and type in notify me in the search field and that'll take you there. And then also I wanted to share that this Saturday, the Morgantown Fire Civil Service Commission in conjunction with the Morgantown Fire Department will be hosting an agility open house for prospective firefighter candidates. And that begins at 10 a.m. The event will take place at the Northside Fire Station, located at 1000 Van Boris Road. Uh, for those who wish to participate in the open house, uh, they can email me or come visit me over at City Hall now, starting tomorrow, <laughs> um, or call, and I can give them all the information that they need. This uh, agility open house is essentially an opportunity for folks to practice and use all of the equipment used in the official agility test. Uh, they can ask questions and gain a stronger understanding of what it takes to successfully complete the agility portion of the candidate test. Uh, and they have the, uh, the opportunity to um, ask questions and speak to Lieutenant John Moore, who basically runs that agility exam. It's, uh, and then I'd like to share also, if, you, if folks go onto the city's website, and they type in fire uh, job interest form. Somewhere along in that form, there's a link that shows the, uh, the actual agility test, what types, what the things that they have to do. It's very interesting. So if folks are interested in that, take an opportunity to click that link and um, learn all about it. And that concludes my report. Thank you. Appreciate everyone who's Having to move this week on city staff, it's a lot of a lot of work and figuring out the internet mm -hmm. was sort of the last thing. <laughs> figuring out all the different things that you need to do to switch over offices is a big takes takes a lot of effort. Um, and then all the people that are helping to do that. So um, report from the city attorney. Thank you, Mayor. I do not have a report this evening. Thank you. Report from council members. Councillor Butcher, do you want to start? I can. Sure. Um, so uh, a couple things, I guess, since our, our 
last meeting where we had a public report. Um, uh, I was able to attend a case conferencing meeting with um, a lot of service providers and um, Bartlett's um, staff as well um, to place individuals into housing. Um, I think there was probably, I mean, in terms of number of service providers, close to 30 people in there. Um, I was on Zoom, so it's a little hard for me to uh, count everybody, but um, I think we had like 12 different agencies represented somewhere around that. Um, and uh, that was really encouraging just to see uh, how every, everybody was focused on getting these 28 people uh, housed and seeing what their status was with voucher, seeing um, what did, what kind of programs we could take advantage of for each specific person and what everybody's different expertise uh, could bring to the table for those different people. So uh, that was a pretty encouraging endeavor and I think like mostly orchestrated by the board um, uh, of Bartlett. So it's an encouraging way of direction to see them going in, especially given the issues that they're facing right now. Um, we had a Suncrest neighborhood meeting um, and we had uh, members of the Star City Fire Department there um, talking about their financial issues. Um, you know, it's one of our neighbors and definitely uh, fires in Star City are going to affect Morgantown, uh, especially 7th Ward. Um, so it was good to hear about their issues. Um, I got to talk with several of them afterwards. Uh, I've talked with some of them before um, because they've been going through this for a long time. Um, and uh, they just got more money from the state. And uh, I don't know, you read it in the paper and it says fire, volunteer fire departments are getting $12 million. I talked to them. The share that Star City Fire Department is getting from that is $350,000. So it's nothing uh, for them that might pay for some equipment. Um, anyway, uh, we also talked about our neighborhood sign. I think we're moving along with that. Um, Matt Cross should have some stuff up <coughs> publicly and like in our sort of neighborhood email chain uh, for people to consider as far as artists for that. Um, we're waiting on one more to get back, but if they don't soon, we're just gonna put it all up there without that person because otherwise we're going to wait forever. Um, and then, yeah, as, as uh, Ms. Ashcraft said earlier, um, I was at the Fair Housing Town Hall with, with Bill who was there as well. Um, we ended up in the same group. <laughs> so uh, as, as well as uh, I believe both the county planner and the city planner ended up in the same group. But... Um, it was, uh, I thought it was a really well done event. Um, I think there's ways that you could have structured that event. I, the thing that I expected from that event was for them to kind of talk about um, the ways people are discriminated before they could get into housing um, and how that limits people's access to housing. Um, but they did also have a large focus on the biggest barrier to housing, which is cost. Um, and so uh, that was really intentional by them, and I think they did a good job of structuring the meeting in such a way that we all got to kind of talk talk about things and brainstorm, and then they told us, tell us one thing that you will do about it, uh, which I thought was just a really cool way to structure that meeting. Um, and as you could tell from Vicki, she, she can uh, hold the meeting well. Um, I wanted to thank you all for coming out tonight to talk about this. Um, we, anytime you guys come and speak to council, um, we do listen and it does make us think and affect the way things happen and it's important. And so um, thanks for coming out to speak. Um, I assure you that there are people all over the city that are, care about this and, and want to do good work. Uh, I talk to a lot of them all the time. And so, um, you know, we, I just want to say like, we see you, we hear you and we understand. And, um, I know from my perspective, um, 
you know, I think that housing is definitely the biggest issue that we have to face in the next decade. Um, and so it's, it's something we need to face head on. And I appreciate everybody's thoughts tonight. And I hope that we can take some of them into consideration. Thank you. We had a Greenmont Neighborhood Association a week ago Monday, and planner Ricky Yeager came and spoke about the idea of a pocket park, which was well received by the uh, neighborhood group. And so they are uh, formulating ideas around how to best perhaps pursue that. So that, that was really nice of him to come and share that information with, with us. And I learned last week that the um, Division of Highways is going to have an environmental assessment informational workshop on April 17th regarding the bridge over the Mon River to the industrial park. And so that is open to the public. It'll be at Westwood Middle School from five to eight if you want to learn more about the environmental impacts or the environmental assessment study. Last what, what was the date on that one more time? It was April it is going to be April 17th from five to eight at Westwood Middle. And uh, this a week ago, this past Wednesday, six days ago, the trail lighting went into operation um, on the above the Deckers Creek Rail Trail uh, on Sturgis Street, which is the last bridge on the Deckers Creek Trail before you get to the amphitheater. So that lighting will be operational daily from dusk to dawn. And that was 10 years in the making. So that was um, a long project. There is a MUB meeting next Tuesday, and um, if you have any items you'd like questions answered on, please let me know. And I'll echo uh, Councillor Butcher's comments that we do appreciate people that come and speak. We hear you, and those are important issues to us as well. So thank you. Um. Yeah, I very much enjoy when anyone from the public comes and speaks. Um, I know that there's some upcoming meetings, hopefully trying to address some of these issues. I know that there's a, a Bartlett advisory group that is formed and the H3 advisory council meets next week. Uh, I participated today in a meeting to help set some priorities um, it was a United Way meeting for the emergency food and shelter program funds that they received. Applications for that should be out now, and if not, definitely within the next 24 to 48 hours, and we will meet again in three weeks to go over applications for that. And um, we did set some priorities of like other shelter and rent, and then utility assistance, and then food assistance. So. Hopefully we can we can look at some of that other shelter to help people who are already on the street and some of the rental assistance to try to stop new new people from from ending up trying to stop it at the cause. But there's only there's less than forty thousand dollars to go around with this set of funding, um, and it always goes very fast. We all know that. Um, I look forward to attending the Advancing Community Trails workshop this week um, with you. Are you going? Yeah. And Drew. And the partnership <coughs> dinner also on Thursday with a lot of us. Um, I hope everyone had a chance to go down and look at the cherry trees, seeing the weather that was coming through today. <laughs> I made my husband drive me down and through <laughs> the, the waterfront again yesterday. Um, <coughs> DC definitely has more, but ours are just as pretty. And you know, you go down and you get to see all sorts of people and talk to all sorts of people, and and it's a great community space that everyone can use. So, yeah, I was happy to to stop down there again before they were gone. Just two things upcoming this weekend. This Friday from five to nine p.m. downtown is First Friday for the Arts. Uh, that's through the Arts Council. Uh, they're having a lot of different events at different places downtown. I'm not going to try to list them all, but a lot of businesses and galleries are hosting artists and musicians. So 
definitely look that up on either um, the Main Street page or the Arts Council of Greater Morgantown's page and get the information about that. And also Saturday morning at 10 a.m., um, Friends of Deckers Creek is doing their annual trail cleanup uh, meet at the outdoor learning park behind the Kroger in Saberton. And you can clean up trash with usually like 100 of your closest friends. <laughs> oh, thank you. Uh, I'll just say again to the audience, thank you for your passion. It's recognized. It's frustrating. It's frustrating to sit in the seat and hear these complaints. I appreciate what you're saying. I wish we had the solution for them. We are doing considerably a number of things to address these issues. We were instrumental in causing the Hazel House of Hope to exist. <coughs> We've been constantly supporting the various organizations. We've tried to pull various other uh, churches, organizations, interested people together to cooperate. It is um, a very large problem for any single group. I wish I had the magic wand. I wish I won the lottery. I certainly devote that attention to it, my attention to that. We do things within the community to make this a community. The pocket park you heard about, that's one of them. I just got a notification that we're going to be looking at a particular curb, a sidewalk, a little thing that we're hoping that we could convince the, the landlord to make uh, more ADA accessible. We are aware of these problems. We do try to address them. There's not a person here on council that would not vote for something that would promote these activities, should we, could we? And we do. We have our limits. Come to us with positive suggestions. Participate. Help us out, and we'll be, we'll be happy to listen to them. At least I will. See the end of my report. All right. Um, let me start by saying, nice shirt. <laughs> and uh, I we will. Have, we have the same tailor. Yeah, that's got to be it. <laughs> and I do. I echo what everyone has said here. I, as somebody who works in the school system, uh, I I've worked with it firsthand with students that not only uh, have <coughs> house insecurity, but have food insecurity. I worked with the at-risk youth for about seven years before I moved on to Morgantown High School. And I've seen what it does in terms of emotional stress that it causes them and the uh, issues it brings into their household. And so you're not being ignored, we do hear you, and I would love to hear any solution that can be presented. Uh, on a little bit of a lighter note, um, maybe we'll, re we'll go for a transition. Uh, Instead, April 14th, we have the International Street Festival. Uh, Sister Cities will be there setting up downtown. So make sure to go there, check out all the different food and stuff they're going to have out. Uh, let's see. And that is, again, April 14th. So not this coming weekend, but the weekend after. I will also reiterate, because we had our neighborhood association meeting, uh, June 8th is our planned neighborhood yard sale. And... That was agreed upon with everyone. We will have a QR code showcasing all the different homes where people can find all the different things they like to purchase. The handmade market in that same vein is April 27th, uh, and the tree board had given out uh, 100 trees last year to be planted, and hopefully we can break that record this year. Um, I also want to express my excitement about the Ruby Amphitheater events that are coming this summer. I read it while teaching actually in class when the post came through and I threw my arms in the air and in sheer excitement and squeal uh, over the plain white tees and postmodern jukebox specifically. Also Diamond Rio and Sarah Evans are fantastic in concert. And then the last thing is a request for those uh, that may be watching at home or here. 
it is warm out and a lot of people I notice, uh, well, more people are out walking their dogs. And I would please ask, please keep your dog on a leash. A lot of people let their dogs off the leash and say my dog is friendly, but a friendly dog off a leash that approaches a skittish dog on a leash can lead to what could be an unavoidable issue. Remember that our parks, trails, and sidewalks are all a shared space, and please be cognizant of those that we are sharing our space with. And that is my report. Thank you. I'd just like to thank everybody for speaking today, and um, really appreciate that. I don't have anything to report from our ward today. Thank you. Um, I also appreciate everyone coming. I know that you don't necessarily see what we do or don't do. Um, we don't know all of what you're doing either. So when you come and bother to come and tell us what your expectations are or what you do for your daily work and daily volunteer work, um, it's good for us to know. Um, as has been mentioned earlier, um, and this is not um, this is not to say oh we can't do anything, but uh, very rarely do cities tackle this kind of an issue all on our own. Um, generally, people help to come up with suggestions, um, best practices, uh, ways that we can work together. And so, in that spirit, I think you've heard from every single person here that people are interested, have noticed that we don't have the beds from Bartlett House anymore, um, have noticed that people um, have died in fires, um, and are, um, as I think providers are also um, talking together more and figuring out how to collaborate more, figuring out perhaps better systems or ways that we can all um, have intake with people and get them into that housing first type model earlier rather than later. Um, so whatever um, we all come up with, we'll be sure and let you know. And whatever you all come up with, please let us know. Uh, it's, um, it's difficult and there's no one solution for everybody because everybody's in a little bit of a different different situation. So. Whatever we can do to be as open and accommodating to the services that other people provide and the ways that they work and whatever we can do to help support the work that needs to be done, um, it's important. I know that Brian has received several phone calls from me the last couple of weeks, like about every two days. Oh, what can you tell me about this? So um, it's not that we're not interested. It's that we don't always know all of the things that are going on and the possible solutions. Not that we don't know some of the solutions. Um, but I really appreciate the comments about um, people being understanding of each other and people um, imagining if you are in someone else's shoes what it would feel like. I think that people don't know even the stories of the people who are up here and the things that we've lived through in our lifetimes and the things that uh, you all have lived through in your lifetime. Some of you are forthcoming and we know, but that doesn't mean that everyone knows what everyone else is thinking. So if we can give each other the benefit of the doubt and figure out ways that we can work together, um, I think we will all prosper and can better help our houseless homeless people who need assistance, even if they have a house <laughs> um, it, in their um, mountain illness or issues with sobriety or just issues of don't have anything in the pockets. So um, appreciate everyone coming tonight. And um, it is hard to make those transitions, Joe. Uh, I wanted to mention the um, BAMP Film Festival, which is on Thursday night, which is at the Met Theater, which is an international mountain film festival uh, originating in Banff, Canada. But 
They receive hundreds of submissions of short films um, each year, and then they um, send them all around the world. And one of the places they stop is here. So it's kind Next of cool. Thursday. This Thursday. This Thursday? Mm hmm. Shoot. Well, most of us are at the map dinner. Yes. Yeah. Mm hmm. Yep. Anyway, it's amazing. And uh, maybe another, another year when. Uh, it's always well attended, anyway. Pardon? It's always well attended. It's, fun. it's always well attended. Yeah. But it's um it's really it's really interesting. So anyway, that's what I have and um I think I think we could entertain a motion to adjourn. Okay. To adjourn? Second. All right. We're done. All right. Thank you.